Hello and welcome to another slice of Daily Bread. I'm so glad that you have joined us today. Today's devotional will be brought to us by Paul Conniff. He's the director of Straight to the Heart Ministries. Paul, once again, welcome back to Daily Bread. It's good to be here. Now, as we always do, let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for your love towards each one of us. And Lord, I just pray that as we open your word, which you have given to us as well, that you will guide us as we study. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I wanna look at uh, the, what I call the hidden half of the gospel, it, and I call it hidden because we tend to emphasize that Jesus died and rose from the dead, and that's absolutely true, and we need that for salvation to be forgiven. And Jesus kept talking about having to suffer. He said, the Son of Man must suffer. That's in Luke 9, 22. And then his disciples, after the baptism of the Holy Spirit said, this is the Christ who must suffer in Acts 3, 18 to 24. And then Paul in Acts 17 and 26 said, Jesus had to suffer and die and rise the third day. So they're all running around this theme, reinforcing suffering, death, and resurrection. And we wanna talk about how that is the, the good news that ministers to the whole person for our suffering and for our sin. And in a previous uh, program I did with Daily Bread, we talked about how to, we prayed with Sandy, someone I trained prayed with Sandy who was not a believer, and we talked about her being abused, and so we were focusing more on Jesus' suffering and how that helped her get healing. She ended up becoming a Christian after she received prayer a number of times. Then she started leading other people to Jesus. And again, Jesus doesn't have an ego. His other-centered love says, I'm willing to heal you first, and then you get to make a decision whether you want me to be your best friend. Sandy made that decision to have him be her savior and best friend. And it's powerful because Jesus' suffering, being alone, abandoned, abused, betrayed, rejected, tells us he can relate to us, he understands us. And that's important because in the book, Caring Enough to be Hear and Be Heard, uh, David Augsburger says, being heard is so close to being loved that for the average person, they're almost indistinguishable. And no matter what happens to us, it boils down to we're not seen and heard and valued. Jesus' suffering, being alone, abused, betrayed, abandoned, being tempted in them as pain, now we can identify with all the addictions we turn to. And he's hanging on the cross with his nerves on fire, carrying all the sin, all the suffering in the world when he's tempted to check out emotionally and he chooses to trust in his Father. He's tempted to believe he's not good enough, that he's no better than the way he's being used and abused. Why? Because that's what we go through. And in Luke 4, 18, Jesus' gospel was, I come to heal broken hearts. I'm anointed by God to give a gospel, to give good news that heals broken hearts. So the outflow, the fruit of his gospel was healing broken hearts. So I want the gospel that I preach and teach and pray is to see hearts being healed. Now, we talked about Sandy and Jesus suffering in the first program. Now I wanna to add to the suffering part, uh, how Jesus deals with sin or suffering from what I call the fruit and root principle. Because often we bring our bad behaviors to Jesus, our anger, our pornography, our affairs, our food addictions. And we should acknowledge that we're trusting in those as false comfort. So we don't wanna minimize that, we wanna bring that. But Jesus said in John 8, that Satan is the father of lies. In Matthew 15 and 18 and 19, he said it's out of the heart come sinful thoughts. So Jesus, Paul, and science all agree that thoughts create feelings and then we have negative feelings, we don't wanna be present with them, so you know what we do? We, we go to certain behaviors to try and medicate. Again, I grew up in an angry home, I learned I'm not good enough and I'm rejected. I didn't like living with that, so I turned to alcohol and drugs and other things to try and medicate it. I can ask forgiveness for the behaviors, but we wanna deal with the fruit and root, both the alcohol, the drugs, the anger, those negative feelings and behaviors, and then what are those thoughts I have that I'm rejected and not good enough? And then begin to receive God's acceptance, receive His goodness, instead of trying to tell myself I'm good enough, tell myself I'm accepted. So what happens inside of our hearts when we suffer? This is very important for us. We get negative thoughts. Now on the screen is a picture of a lemon. When you think about a lemon, you know a lemon is sour. So when I'm doing a live training, I cut the lemon, have somebody eat it, and then everybody watching, their mouths start puckering. Why? Because you think about a lemon, your brain knows that a lemon is sour, those thoughts create chemical reactions and your mouth reacts and begins to pucker. Now this is Neuroscience 101. If we know this from neuroscience in a simple demonstration with a lemon, 
Satan knows this, and that's why he's called the father of lies. So he whispers lies in first-person language. He doesn't say, I'm not, you're not good enough, Paul, you're rejected. I get a thought whispered, I'm not good enough, I'm rejected. I don't even know it's coming from the father of lies. I begin to believe it. So we try and change our behaviors or bad fruit, and so we do one or two things. We try and stop doing the bad fruit, and, or we, and then we return to it, or we switch bad fruits. I can go from being an alcoholic to a workaholic and call that freedom when I've just switched fruit. So we return to our bad fruit or we switch to another fruit. Why? Because we don't know about the fruit and root principle. We don't know that we're receiving negative messages about ourselves in life before and after we fall, and then they become a false identity creating all kinds of guilt. Thoughts like, I'm undeserving, I can't be forgiven, I can't be accepted, I have to pay the price for my sins, even though Jesus did 2,000 years ago. I'm bad, I failed too many times, I'm not good enough. These thoughts keep us from receiving God's forgiveness that he provided 2,000 years ago. How powerful are these belief systems? Jesus is God, he's walking with his disciples for three and a half years, days, weeks, months, and years, saying, I am going to suffer, die, and rise from the dead. They never heard it because their belief system was militant Messiah, militant Messiah overthrow Rome. So they couldn't hear it. Let's look at this from a uh, food addiction. Let's say somebody is struggling with overeating, eating too much of her favorite ice cream. She gets married to a nice guy. He's not cheating her and not having an affair, but she has a belief system, I'm alone. Those are going to, that negative thought will create negative feelings. So she turns to ice cream because she's feeling bad. And she turns to her favorite ice cream. She doesn't eat one bowl or two, she eats five or six. So while she's eating the ice cream, guess what? She's feeling good. But ice cream is cold and it numbs the tongue, just like cocaine numbs us. Different drugs, same result, we're numbing out. So the first bowl of ice cream tastes much better, has much more flavor, she keeps chasing that. So she starts out feeling bad. While she's eating the ice cream, she's feeling good. But after she gets done, an hour later, the devil's pounding her, and so then she feels shame and guilt. So she goes from feeling bad to feeling good for a short time to feeling numb or worse. So what does she do when she's feeling shame? She returns to food. Then she feels bad again. She feels good while she's eating the ice cream, but then she feels bad. Then she gains weight, it's hard to hide, and she's sincerely saying, God, if you will forgive me one more time, I will never overeat again. The problem isn't the overeating, it's the belief system behind the behavior and the negative thoughts. So now she has a habit, I feel bad, I go to food. I feel bad, I go to food. She keeps bringing her food to God. She should, but if we don't deal with that belief system, if we don't deal with that root, then it will continue to produce bad fruit. The good news is we have a Jesus who is alone and abandoned. But what happens if she does this 50 times, 100 times? And many of you watching know that feeling, whether it's alcohol, drugs, food, whatever it is, what happens to your faith is it goes down, down, down. So how does Jesus resolve this conflict and deal with the root? Well, be, how do we receive forgiveness in our minds and our hearts? Because if we receive forgiveness in our heart, we'll be free and we won't have to trust in food, drugs, etc., to medicate the pain because the pain will be gone and replaced with God's peace. Well, everywhere I go, people tell, tell me the same phrase, I just need to forgive myself. Who's the power source in that statement? I am. Who's missing? God and Jesus. Isn't that interesting that no matter what church I go to, we have a statement that puts ourselves in the center and removes God and what he's done for us. So what's my part in being forgiven and being released from my failures in the past? What do I mean when I say I just need to forgive myself? Because I've got all these negative thoughts and all this bad fruit. I just need to release myself from my guilt and shame when I think about my past. That's what we're saying. I need to try harder to believe God's word telling me the truth that I've already been forgiven. But it's not working. So what I'm really saying is I need to try harder to do what I'm already unable to do. What I need to do is let God release those negative thoughts that I have about myself when I think about my past. Because those negative thoughts grow into negative feelings, and then, they, then I go to my negative behaviors. So we have to deal with the fruit and the root. And again, Moses didn't say he was a murderer. He said God's forgiving. David didn't say I forgive myself for being a murderer. He said God's forgiving. 
Paul didn't say, I forgive myself for being a terrorist to the early church. He said God is a forgiving God. Nobody in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation ever said those words, I just need to forgive myself. It's not biblical. It's, and we were forgiven 2,000 years ago at the cross. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgiveness was provided 2,000 years ago at the cross. So we need to learn how to receive what was already for, provided. So we need to ask a question. Is that phrase, I just need to forgive myself, biblical or not biblical but cultural? It's not biblical but cultural. So, so far we've seen Jesus says he did nothing, we can do nothing in our own strength. No one from Genesis to Revelation ever said those words. And God already provided forgiveness 2,000 years ago at the cross because we can't forgive ourselves. We can't talk ourselves into believing we're forgiven. Jesus said you can do nothing apart from God. In Matthew 15, 29, he said uh, you can do nothing apart, 1926, you can do nothing apart from God. It's impossible to do it apart from God. And whose forgiveness is deeper and stronger? Me trying to tell myself I'm forgiven, trying to convince myself I'm forgiven, or receiving Jesus' forgiveness that he already provided 2,000 years ago, especially when the word receive is mentioned in the New Testament in the King James 257 times. So, to summarize, we go through negative experiences growing up. They grow into negative feelings. Jesus went through negative experiences. He was tempted with the thoughts. He never, ever believed any of Satan's lies whispered in first-person language. He trusted in his Father. So now he can forgive us and heal us and set us free. He was tempted without giving in to those thoughts when he's alone, abused, betrayed, abandoned, and rejected. Now let's look at John. John had an affair and his wife. He'd had other affairs before. The second affair was when his wife was pregnant with their second daughter. And he's using the affair to try and medicate his pain for not being important. He's not justifying his affair. I'm not justifying it was wrong and did a lot of damage. And he's carrying guilt and shame and regret and wondering if he'd ever be forgiven and rebuild his marriage. To identify with John, Jesus is tempted to believe that he's not important, but he trusts in his Father. He's tempted to medicate his pain with false comforts, but he trusts his Father and receives his Father's love. He tempted to believe he's rejected forever at the cross when he can't see, sense, or feel his Father's presence, but even when he can't, he trusts in his Father and he says, into your hands I commit my spirit. It's a statement of faith. He's trusting in his Father when he can't see, sense, or feel his Father's presence. So we take Jesus' story and we move it into John's story of his sin, guilt, and shame without excusing his sin, bringing the sin, bringing the failure, bringing the harm he's done to Jesus. So this is not cheap grace. He's having to own what he's done. And here's a sample prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for choosing to fulfill prophecy. When you were tempted to believe that you were not important and you're hanging on the cross, you're tempted to numb your pain and to believe you'd been rejected forever that your situation was hopeless as you're crying out, Psalm 22, 1, he turned scripture into prayer, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So you could be tempted with my negative thoughts that I'm not important and I need to medicate my pain in my own strength in a way that harms my family. I'm turning to false comforts when I'm having affairs and betraying my wife at a time when she really needs me. So I don't have to make any excuses for my behavior. I can own them fully and completely. And you took all my rejection, sin, shame, and seeing my situation as hopeless. Thank you for also breaking all the negative bonding to my selfish choices as I choose to agree with your word that you have forgiven me for everything I did and did not know about my sins, my failures, my wounds and lies as a husband and as a father. He's owning it. And as I receive my truest, deepest identity as your son with the fullness of your forgiveness, your acceptance, and the importance you placed upon me as your child. I'm also receiving your faithfulness you maintain during your trial so I can ask my wife how I've hurt her and how I can rebuild trust with her as she sees me growing in your grace and surrounding myself with other men who are also choosing to grow in your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. The best John can do with his own faithfulness is to fail his wife in a critical time in her life. As he receives Jesus' faithfulness daily, and again, this program is daily bread, as he receives Jesus' faithfulness that Jesus already developed 2,000 years ago, he can grow and get healing and freedom. Who's the power source for this change in John's life? Is it Jesus or himself? 
He's not telling himself he's forgiven. He's letting Jesus heal him and receiving his forgiveness. So what he's doing is he's revealing something about the character of God that he's receiving the finished work of God in Christ as he's receiving Christ's forgiveness and Christ's faithfulness. Instead of trying harder to do what John has already revealed that he cannot do in his own strength. Is this making John more interdependent with Christ in the body of Christ or more independent trusting in his own strength? It's making him more interdependent. He's surrounding himself with other men now and growing in Christ in a community of other men seeking God's grace and truth. And he uses his testimony at men's ministry so others can learn from it from his mistakes. And then he's rebuilt his marriage and it's been going strong for many, many years as his wife also received he healing. So he's gone from being unfaithful, engaging in sinful behaviors that harmed his wife and his family, not being important and rejected, to receiving God's forgiveness God provided 2,000 years ago, flowing into rebuilding trust with his wife and ministry with other men and honoring Jesus two by two ministry. This is what I call the the whole gospel or the whole news about the good news for the whole person for the whole world. And as I close with prayer, I'm praying that if you're struggling with guilt and shame today, you'll realize those are strong feelings telling you you've walked outside of God's will and that God wants to deal with the belief systems. He wants to reveal the negative thoughts about yourself creating the guilt and shame. And He wants you to receive His forgiveness instead of trying to do what only Jesus could do and Jesus has already done 2,000 years ago. Heavenly Father, thank you that you knew we would fail ourselves, fail you, and fail those closest to us. And instead of running away from us, you ran to us. And you had Jesus be tempted with John's negative thoughts, our negative thoughts about ourselves as we think about our failures, and all the guilt and shame that grows out of that. And as Jesus took that into the cross and you raised him from the dead, you've earned the right to reveal our negative thoughts, release the negative thoughts, release the guilt and shame, and replace it with your supernatural love, forgiveness, and peace. Give us the gift of receiving what you have already done for us so we don't have to live with that guilt and shame and run from you, but instead run to you because of your finished work for us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.